What is up, you guys? What is going on? As you can see, I'm working on my podcast studio behind me. Hopefully, we'll get better audio quality soon. Welcome to Controversial Thoughts with Carnivore MD. We're still talking about coronavirus. It's still relevant. I'm kind of sick of talking about it too, but I'll just share some of my thoughts on it from this last week. If you guys want to check out the second edition of my book, you can pre-order that, thecarnivorecodebook.com. I'm going to reveal the cover this weekend. Stay tuned. The new cover of The Carnivore Code is coming. There's the old cover behind me. You know it well. I'm just full of controversial thoughts. I just like to think outside the box. As my buddy Kirk Parsley says, I reserve the right to be wrong about everything. But let's, let's do some controversial thinking here. Let me share my screen. Let's take a look at YouTube and um, take a look at the headlines that are happening right now on YouTube with regard to coronavirus. So I think it's pretty clear that the media is still wanting us to be pretty darn afraid of this virus. Coronavirus cases spike across nearly half of the US. At least 14 states see an increase in coronavirus hospitalizations. US market suffers the worst sell-off. Let's look at this video, which I think is really interesting. US coronavirus cases top 2 million. So everyone is talking about this spike in coronavirus cases. New cases on the rise. U.S. passes 2 million coronavirus cases as states continue to relax guidelines. And yet another one. Could see coronavirus cases grow dramatically in the fall. Former FDA commissioner. So what is going on here? Everybody's worried. Coronavirus cases are spiking. As I've said before, I think the only number we should be looking at is coronavirus deaths. Because if you look at the data, we're also doing way more testing. And if you do more tests, you're going to see more positives. This is not really debatable. It's something that's quite clear and you can easily find the data for how many tests we are actually doing right now. My friend, Brian Sanders, had a great post on his um, social media talking about this. I will pull it up here. So I think this graphic from Brian illustrates things pretty well. Up here, you can see the number of cases that are being, the number of tests that are being conducted. Oh, look at this. Every day we are trending to increase the amount of cases, the tests that are being conducted. No surprise, we're seeing new cases when we're testing more people. So here in June, we are doing the most tests that we've ever done. But as Brian points out, across the majority of states, death rates are not spiking. They're continuing to fall and follow the same sort of far curve that we've seen pretty much everywhere. You can see Brian illustrating that here. So remember that if you're getting stuck on all of this media messaging about new cases rising, look at the death rates in any particular state and look at how they're actually changing. And I think you'll be surprised that they're not spiking as much as the media would lead you to believe. The case that's been highlighted most prominently is Arizona. So let's go to the Arizona data and take a look at this. Well, what I'm gonna show you is the actual Arizona Medical Board or the Arizona, this is from the Arizona Department of Health and Human Services. And you can see here that they're giving you data up until the 11th of June, and there were two deaths on the 11th of June in Arizona. Now, this is a little confusing because new COVID deaths reported today is 17. Of course, today I'm recording this is June the 12th. They're not reporting June the 12th, but I can tell you that a few days ago I was looking at this and they were reporting the new COVID-19 deaths as 23, but there's no 23s on this graph. The highest one is the 7th of June. So I'm not sure if this number is COVID deaths reported on this day, and it may be funneling into some of this previous time over here, but the Arizona Department of Human Services is showing two coronavirus deaths on June the 11th. So in the state where we are seeing a 232% increase, the largest of increase of any state in new cases, I am not seeing in their data any reflection of an increase in deaths. Could this be due to more testing? It absolutely could. Now what's confusing here 
is that if you go to Google and you try to get data on Arizona's deaths, Google seems to be showing a very different story. And this is uh, the coronavirus deaths that I'm showing here in Arizona. And if you look on July the 11th, which I just showed you on the Arizona graph, Google is showing 32 deaths in Arizona. So this is what's I think confusing for people. The Arizona website is showing two deaths and Google is showing 32. So I think this is quite concerning. What we're seeing here according to the Google is a rise in deaths in Arizona. But what we have to be very careful to sort out here, and I think this is gonna take a little more time to sort out is how much of this rise in coronavirus cases is actually due to new deaths and new infections, or are we really just looking at new cases rising because we're doing more testing? And as I've spoken about previously, is the testing really that valuable? How good is the testing? What do we know about this? It's a little shaky. But I do feel like the media is just loving the fact that coronavirus cases are spiking everywhere, but we're continuing to do more tests. We're doing more tests every day. Here's the headline in Arizona. Emergency plan. <laughs> as coronavirus cases spike. But are we gonna see a spike in deaths? We will have to wait and see. I um, would suspect that we will not see a significant spike in deaths, but again, I could be wrong. I would suspect that we will not. I wanna revisit the CDC site that I've come back to a number of times. Um, and you will see that these numbers are continuing to fluctuate. So this is the CDC site that I've spoken about. All of the websites are here if you guys wanna see them. Daily updates of totals by week and state for provisional coronavirus death counts. As I said before, it was at 99 and it remains at about 104. So I saw over the last two days, it's bumping up and down. It was down to 102 the other day, now it's back to 104. So for this year so far, the percentage of expected deaths, we are seeing a little bit of a bump. But I think that if we really are worried about this, we need to watch this moving forward and my suspicion, my hypothesis, which again may be wrong, is that this may normalize to around about 100 by the end of the year, because as Kirk Parsley and I have talked about, if there is a bad flu season or a bad respiratory virus season, then it's likely that in the fall, less people will die, um, because those who are most susceptible may have died sooner. And again, all deaths are tragic, and not dehumanizing or being callous or trivializing any of these deaths. I'm just trying to give some context for all of this coronavirus discussion. I also wanna share some stuff that I found about Turkey. This is quite an interesting article that you all may want to read from The Economist. Um, and it is talking about how Turkey may have done things very well in this situation. So I don't live in Turkey, so I don't know exactly what they've done. But if you look at what happened here, what Turkey got right about the pandemic. It helps not to keep old people in nursing homes. Imagine that. I just wanna highlight this. Turkey has defied lockdown orthodoxy. Rather than place the whole economy into a coma, authorities ordered the young and the elderly to stay at home and asked everyone else, aside from those in consumer facing businesses to show up for work. Biggest cities placed in a curfew. Some domestic flights resumed on June the 1st. Cafes, restaurants, beaches, parks, and reopened. But children, people over 65, still not allowed outdoors for more than a few hours a week. Okay, strategy seems to have worked. The most vulnerable escaped the worst of the pandemic while those infected, mostly working age adults, generally recovered. Those who are less likely to have insulin resistance, those who are less likely to be nutritionally compromised, generally recovered. Despite a high number of cases, the death count has been low, even given the likelihood of serious underreporting. New cases plateaued at around 1,000 a day since mid-May, down from a high of over 5,000 a month earlier. The same sort of curve that we're seeing everywhere. Deaths never topped 127 in a single day. And they ended up with roughly the same testing rate as Britain and a death rate, oh, same testing rate as France, and a death rate 10 times lower than Britain's. 10 times lower than Britain's without locking down the economy. Imagine that. Imagine that. And they were doing the same amount of testing as France. So it's a difficult thing to to sort out, right? Is this the testing that's causing things to spike? Are we gonna see a spike in deaths? We'll have to keep watching, but it does seem like the media is still trying to get us to be fearful. And look, we're just not gonna hide from this. It was inevitable. And that's what I've been saying all along. At some point we have to reopen the economy. 
Are we going to stay locked down forever until we get a vaccine that doesn't exist? No, we have to reopen the economy. As I've been saying throughout the whole thing, we're going to come in contact with things that are going to be infectious insults. We have to be strongest in the face of those. And over the last 10 weeks, we could have been changing our metabolic health. All those who are dying now could have been instructed to stop eating bagels and donuts, could have been instructed in ways that could have improved their metabolic health and that probably would have saved lives. But I haven't seen that in the media at all. So that's really the saddest part for me throughout all this. And I just have to note that it really does seem like uh, the media is continuing to do fear mongering and that the messaging is not so great. But don't worry guys, because June is National Candy Month. <laughs> because June is National Candy Month. They make candy in the form of eggs. <laughs> so gummy bears, sour straws, oh my, you can eat all of these and more. Started by the National Confectioners Association to celebrate that candy adds value to our lives. Candy has been produced for over a hundred years, which means you have a lot of catching up to do if you want to eat it all. So work your way through this copious amounts of candy with us this June. This is what we're seeing. Don't forget, June is candy month, you guys, while people are continuing to suffer with metabolic health and coronavirus. You can have a candy battle, make candy sushi. You can DIY your favorite candy. Why we love candy month, most delicious month of the year. Candy's economic impact. Did you know that candy is worth 35 billion? <laughs> really? It reminds us to stay balanced? What in the world is going on? Everything in moderation. Yeah, right? Sure. That's just, this is nefarious advertising. Everything in moderation, a little bit of poison is just fine for you. Well, what is moderation? If you actually look at the data, nobody knows what moderation is. This doesn't work. You can't have a little bit of garbage in your diet. And this type of messaging is insidious and it's misleading the general public, but that's what's winning right now, you guys. That is what is winning. June is National Candy Month. We have a coronavirus pandemic, but June is National Candy Month. You have 100 years of catching up to do $35 billion industry, all right? So I wanna pivot for a moment. One of the things that I get asked about the most, one of the podcasts that I'm most excited about doing in the near future is with my buddy Rob Wolf, who has a new book coming out with Diana Rogers called Sacred Cow, talking about the importance of regenerative agriculture. I'm gonna release that podcast in a few weeks. I believe Rob's book is due out at the beginning of July. If you look at Sacred Cow, uh, you can find, I think it's, I'll send, I'll look at the website real quickly and tell you guys, hold on. Go to sacredcow.info if you wanna get more information about this pretty freaking important project. And I got an advanced copy of Sacred Cow. I've been reading it, I think it's awesome. And I'm super excited to do this interview with Rob talking about the importance of regenerative agriculture. One of the things that gets parroted more than anything else is that cows are the worst contributor to environmental problems, to greenhouse gases and emissions. And I wanna show you guys why this is based on massively false misleading information. There is a great graphic in this book that I will share with you. I will go into much more detail about this with Rob. Claims that livestock emit as much greenhouse gas as transportation are false. And they're based on a 2006 FAO study called Livestock's Long Shadow. And the problem is that livestock was considered as a life cycle, but transportation was only considered as out of the tailpipe. So if you actually, this is comparing apples to oranges. They're comparing the amount of greenhouse gases from livestock, which incidentally is methane, which participates in a carbon cycle and is very different than the emissions from a car, which we can talk about on the podcast, to the life cycle emissions from a cow to the direct emissions from a tailpipe of transportation. And if you do apples to apples, what you find is 5% for livestock, 14% for transit. No one has done life cycle emissions for transportation. This is what you should challenge anyone, whether it's Jonathan Safran Fowler writing that ridiculous piece in the New York Times, anyone who says that cows are contributing the most greenhouse gases doesn't understand the FAO data and probably hasn't read that data in the first place. They're comparing a life cycle analysis of a cow to a tailpipe emission of a transportation sector. It's not apples to apples. Direct emissions shows that they are very, very different and the transportation 
is upwards of three times as much as livestock. And in the process, livestock properly raised can be carbon negative by sequestering carbon into the soil, can provide us with very nutritious food and lead to organic matter in the soil, which helps us grow more plants to feed more animals. These are not the same comparisons. This is wildly inaccurate reporting, and it just goes to show how nefarious many of these things appear to be and just how misleading so much of this messaging is. And it's super frustrating for me to see. I've unpacked it in my book, The Carnivore Code. Rob does a great job of unpacking it in his book as well. There's another website that I wanna share with you all. If you have questions about that, if there are people who don't believe this, send them to this website. This is a joint FAO and IAEA program, right? The website is here. You can find it, you can recopy it. It's a long website, but what does it say? Atmospheric methane concentrations have leveled off while the world population of ruminants has increased at an accelerated rate. The conclusions they come to in the FAO data, this is an FAO website, are that at the end of this, these projects have resulted in improved productivity of livestock. Perhaps they may also need, may also be contributing to the reducing the impact of ruminants on the environment. This suggestion is not meant to dispute the issue of global warming. However, it does suggest a need to reassess the contribution of global livestock production to the entire process. If you read this website, which is an FAO website, it shows that world ruminant numbers are still increasing, and yet the global balance of methane has leveled off meaning methane can be coming from other sources. And if you read the data, if you really dig into this, what you will find is methane comes from bogs, it comes from the ocean, it comes from termites, it comes from landfills, and it comes from tilling of the soil. To pin it on cows is to not understand the data. So this is one of the hot button issues for me. You guys know that I'm super passionate about regenerative agriculture. There's so much about this I can't wait to talk about with Rob. Check out the project at Sacred Cow. Check out what they're doing, support that, and realize the data that these people are parroting regarding methane emissions is based on false data, not considering life cycle to life cycle with ruminants. If you actually look at the real data, as I show in my book, or at least data that's comparing apples to apples, more like EPA direct emissions data from my book, you find that ruminants contribute a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to the transportation sector. A fraction. If you're comparing apples to apples, and the direct emissions. Anyone who claims otherwise, question their sources. Invariably, they are talking about the flawed FAO report from 2006. So I'll show you the graphic from my book. Greenhouse gas emission sources, beef cattle, 1.9%. Total US, US greenhouse gas emissions in 2016. That's ruminants, that's other livestock. These are agricultural crops, even more greenhouse gas emissions transportation, industry, electricity generation, way up here. This is from an EPA report in 2016, you guys. I am not making this stuff up. I would never do that. Here is the reference. You can look at it if you want to see it. EPA report, inventory of units, greenhouse gas emissions and sinks, 1990 to 2014. There you go. Flawed FAO reporting, fear-mongering propaganda. I wanna close with a few things. These have become a fun little mini, casual, non-brushed edges podcast. Some fascinating stuff. As if you needed another study to, to show you many of the things that I've been talking about for so long. May 29th, newly diagnosed diabetes associated with a higher risk of mortality than known diabetes in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. More data connecting insulin resistance, newly diagnosed diabetes and insulin resistance with COVID outcomes. Imagine that. And perhaps the scariest thing I will share with you tonight is this other data showing that in the UK, doctors want to ban junk food. Great. But they also want to ban meat and dairy. Who knows why? Because pictures like this are what people think about. And this is the problem. If you eat this, you will not be healthy. But is this burger the problem? Or is it these french fries and this soda? Here's the problem. Don't blame the meat for what the bread did and what the vegetable oils did and what the processed sugar did. And this is the fear that taxation is going to limit our human population 
from having access to healthy food. If you listen to the podcast I did with Asim Hotra, I asked him, in your opinion, the guy that he saw in the clinic or in the hospital who had his heart stented, got served a hamburger and a milkshake, I said, what's the best part? What's the worst part? He said, well, definitely the worst part is the bread and the milkshake. It's not the beef. So don't blame the bread. Don't blame the meat for what the bread and the milkshake have done. That is a problem. That is what is scary. So check out my new book, you guys. Check out the second edition of The Carnivore Code. Hopefully this is helpful. I love doing these. It just gets stuff off my chest. I'm working on my podcast studio, thecarnivorecodebook.com. Check out Sacred Cow. Check out Rob's project. It's super important for us to be informed about the actual source of environmental problems. It's not coming from the cows. And especially when they think about farms like Belcampo, and White Oak, and others that are doing this absolutely the right way, this can be a carbon sink. And the last thing I will share is a study from the University of Michigan that shows this in clear detail that when you raise cows property with what properly, with what they call adaptive multi-paddock grazing, you can see profound decreases in carbon emissions and you can see carbon sequestration. There's literature to prove this. If you wanna share this literature, if you wanna find this literature to impress your family, to make plant-based advocates' hair, head explode, May 2018, the impacts of soil carbon sequestration on life cycle, greenhouse gas emissions in Midwestern USA beef finishing systems. So what you'll find, adaptive multi-paddock grazing can sequester large amounts of soil carbon. Emissions from the grazing system were offset completely by soil carbon sequestration. Soil carbon sequestration from well-managed grazing may help to mitigate climate change. There it is, you guys. If you know people in your life who believe that cows are causing climate change, this is important. This is a really sharp edge of the sword issue. And people are so badly misinformed, just like they are with everything else. Again, it's all in my book. Check it out, thecarnivorecodebook.com. Appreciate you all. Stay radical. I'm out. It's Friday night. I'm going to go read some books. Maybe go foil.